Professor Russell Holmes to give the talk today. Russ got his uh, PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton and joined our faculty not long after that. He currently holds the rank of a full professor and is also director of graduate studies. Russ is a world expert in the area of organic electronics. He's not only a distinguished scholar, but he's also an award-winning teacher. And he's going to tell us a bit about his work today. Welcome, Russ. Thank you. OK, thank you for the introduction, uh, Satish. I appreciate it. It's my true pleasure uh, to speak here today. Certainly, uh, I've attended many plenary lunches. And it's a pleasure to speak to industrial visitors, but also your colleagues, any chance you get. Um, so as Satish alluded to, I'm, uh, I'm an expert in principle in organic electronic materials and devices, and the title of my talk today is trying to reflect, in some respects, the spirit of I-Prime. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about how materials and interfacial engineering has ultimately enabled um, the commercialization of organic light emitting devices, or OLEDs as they're often called, as a uh, practical display technology. Uh, I'm the program leader for flexible electronics and photovoltaics and also a member of the Department of Chemical Engineering and uh, Material Science. Oh, that's cut off at the top. Um, so to start, before getting into the, to the discussion of OLEDs, I want to give just a brief background on the flexible electronics and photovoltaics program here in I-Prime. And so we're a group of researchers that's really interested in establishing new materials, processing schemes, and device solutions uh, involving novel semiconductors for electronics, optoelectronics, and photovoltaics. And you can see, I won't go through all of the, uh, the different expertise here of our member faculty, um, but we really cover a lot of area from the range of fundamental characterization of new materials to the development of new processing schemes to the development of devices. And so we really cover that entire range of, of expertise in the life cycle of taking an electronic material from initial conception to uh, effectively an interesting application in flexible electronics and photovoltaics. Thinking a little bit about displays, which is really where I want to focus today, if we think about displays, really these are becoming ubiquitous devices. Um, I don't think I have to go into the different segments of this market, but we can talk briefly about some of the places that are relevant for the context of OLEDs. So certainly looking at the top left corner, we can think about um, devices like mobile phones, wearable technology including watches, and even gaming systems as situations that are ultimately exploiting small displays for mobile and typically battery life type applications. Certainly televisions remain an active area of um, use of displays, larger televisions with novel form factors, and we'll talk more about that form factor angle in a moment. Um, tablets and laptops and even places like automotive and, uh, and aerospace type applications for, for displays. When you try to think about organic light emitting devices in 2018, you actually see a lot of the same photographs and a lot of the same products. And that's because organic light emitting devices have actually been fairly broadly commercialized already. And so looking at some of these flagship cellular phones that we're aware of, whether it's the iPhone 10, the Galaxy 9, the Samsung Edge type products, or these uh, Samsung Gear and Apple Watch products, these are all displays based on organic light emitting devices. And so many of you already in the room have an OLED display in your pocket. Um, increasingly, we're seeing applications for OLEDs in automotive applications as well, and that could include integrating displays into the environment inside the cabin, or it could include taking monochromatic OLEDs and trying to integrate them into things like taillights, as is the case on this Audi A8 vehicle. Um, while the integration of OLEDs into mobile displays has been actually fairly widespread to date, certainly OLEDs are still growing in terms of traction for integration into televisions, LG has a number of products in this space integrating organic light emitting devices into televisions. And I want to note just this particular device here, which is a fairly recent release by LG. This is a 77 inch what's called wallpaper television. And it's called a wallpaper television because despite that large dimension in terms of its ultimate width, you're talking about a device thickness of only about 0.15 inches. And we'll talk more about what enables that incredible form factor in a moment. Okay? And so really, when you're thinking about these organic LED televisions, you're thinking about almost a different paradigm for how you interact with displays. And that's not even mentioning the fact that you can also think about curved surfaces and flexible displays. I also want to highlight another application space. This is not yet commercial, um, but this is a display that just was announced last week at the Society for Information Display meeting uh, from Google and LG. This is a very high resolution OLED display. It's not easy to appreciate in this case because it's meant for virtual reality. And so a place where high definition, high resolution OLED displays are becoming prominent potentially is for these displays where you're actually talking about high resolution right in a virtual reality headset. 
And certainly there's a number of companies, including Google and LG, working to try and realize this aggressive goal. So when we think about why are organic LEDs being utilized in these various spaces, there's a few different things we can point to and a few different things that are worth mentioning. The first and most important distinguishing point between an OLED display and an LCD display is the fact that an OLED display is itself electroluminescent. So what that means is that unlike an LCD display where the liquid crystal element is just acting as a gate for light coming from a backlight, in an OLED you have a film that itself is emitting the light under current excitation. So there's no backlight anymore. You have a film that's maybe 100 nanometers thick. When it sees current, it emits light. When there's no current, it doesn't emit light. And so the first thing that does is removes all of the hardware associated with the backlight. And so it allows you to get these very thin displays. The second thing it does is it allows you to have fairly high contrast displays, right? Because now when that pixel is turned off, it's truly black, right? You don't have this ghosting or leakage of light from the backlight anymore in your display. Um, these devices are attractive as well. They can be very power efficient, and that's something that certainly is still being fully exploited. But in principle, when you're talking about battery life as a key design element, which is something that increasingly is a design element in just about every piece of electronics, um, these sorts of displays are attractive. Something that is just starting to become realized and just starting to become exploited is the ability to put devices onto flexible displays and flexible substrates. And so these materials are intrinsically compatible with plastic substrates, with foil substrates, and they're also compatible with roll-to-roll -roll processing at low temperature and high throughput. So you can really envision the ability now to have a truly flexible, foldable type display environment uh, that you can interact with. And so when we're thinking about future applications, I think I've addressed a lot of these already, but trying to go to really fully flexible displays is a goal. And so if you look at, for instance, this edge device here, and many of you might have one of these devices in your pocket, the display actually curves around the edge of the phone. So this is actually a flexible OLED display on a plastic substrate, but it's being held rigid in the frame, right? In the future, we'd like to get to the point, and there's companies working towards this goal, of fully flexible displays where perhaps you could imagine having a cell phone that unfolds almost like a pamphlet to now give you a display that's the size of a tablet. Right? Or maybe a laptop that when you unfold the display in the keyboard, you now get something that's the size of a keyboard. Right? So this ability to have true flexibility uh, in your display environment. So with that, I'll just give a, a brief outline here. The first part of my talk, I'd like to spend really trying to give you some perspective on what is an organic semiconductor and what is an OLED. Right? So how are these materials, what do these materials look like? How are they integrated to LEDs? What are the metrics we have to worry about? I'll then give you sort of two vignettes. The first I'll spend a lot more time on because it was really critical in um, the development of this technology, but talking about how materials engineering ultimately was responsible for enabling um, the commercialization of OLEDs. We'll talk a little bit about how interfacial engineering is something that is increasingly being exploited to maximize efficiency and improve device stability. And then finally, I'll conclude by giving some perspective on some ongoing areas of research uh, that are certainly interested, interesting on the academic level, but I think also at the industrial level as well. So first, to give some perspective on what we mean by an organic semiconductor, these are typically going to be organic conjugated molecules. And so if you look at all of the systems I have plotted up here, these are all conjugated small molecules or conjugated polymers, and that conjugation is essential because it's the delocalized pi bonding that's appearing above those uh, effectively benzene rings that allows you to get electron transport across and between these molecules in a thin film. Right, so all organic semiconductors are going to be conjugated systems. Many of these molecules, interestingly, uh, can be thought of in some respects as pigments or dyes. And so a lot of these molecules can trace their ancestry back to either photographic film pigments or to laser dyes that were initially studied in the 1960s. And they were attractive then for the ability to tune their optical behavior with synthetic chemistry and are still attractive now in that respect. Right? By careful functionalization of these molecules, we can change emission wavelengths, absorption wavelengths, and the properties of the molecule in a way that could be useful for applications. Finally, I'll just remind you again that these sorts of materials, if you're thinking about the conjugated small molecules, for instance, are typically processed out of the vapor phase. And so you'll start with a solid pigment, sublime that material into a vapor phase in a vacuum environment, and then that vapor will deposit on a waiting substrate. If you're talking about conjugated polymers like this uh, MEHPPV system, you would be talking about solution processing, which in the lab might involve spin coating, 
at an industrial level would involve conventional coding and printing type processes. But ultimately, these are both methods that are amenable with flexible substrates and roll-to-roll -roll processing, which allows you to think about these unusual and new applications for this technology. So I want to give a little bit of a <coughs> perspective on where this technology ultimately came from, because it's actually a bit of an interesting journey. So it's really only in the last 10 years that I think we could really say organic light emitting devices have been strongly commercialized, right? And really it's only in the last few years that you could argue that it's really exploding across these mobile device space, right? Certainly with the iPhone 10 having an OLED display, that was a really, really big deal. Um, but the study of electroluminescence from these organic conjugated molecules is actually very old. And so in fact, you can go back 50 years and find studies where individuals are looking at what happens to these molecular systems when you run an electrical current through them. And this is data from a seminal paper by Helfrick and Schneider in 1965, where they were basically taking a, a classic organic semiconductor, in this case this is just anthracene, so three fused phenyl rings, and looking at what happens when you take a single crystal of this material, so a discrete single crystal, put electrodes on the crystal, and literally just put a voltage across the crystal, right? run current through it. Now this crystal is obviously macroscopic, five millimeters thick. You've got electrodes on either side, and this is a photograph of the result that they saw. This white region is actually the electroluminescence, the light being emitted from the crystal at one of the electrodes. And so you might naturally say, well, that's really exciting. You know, why didn't this start a revolution in organic light emitting devices in the 60s that would parallel what happened with heterojunction in organic LEDs in the 60s and 70s? And the main reason why is that the conductivity of these materials is very low. So if you look at the voltages being applied to these crystals in order to get any kind of electroluminescence out of them, you're talking about kilovolts. Right? And so at the time, this was really something that, while interesting, was almost a curiosity of the system because the practicality was just not there yet. Really, the significant innovation that had to come about was to transition away from these discrete single crystals and towards nanometer scale thin films. And seminal work done in the 80s at Kodak by Ching Tang and Steve Van Slyke effectively brought us to that point. And so now the idea was to say, well, instead of growing a single crystal, I'm going to deposit sequentially organic thin films in a vacuum system where I have the precise control needed to get films that are tens of nanometers thick. And this is actually a figure from their original paper that shows their first OLED device. It's a glass substrate with an Indian, Indian tin oxide transparent anode on top two organic thin films that are normally tens of nanometers thick. One is a hole transporting diamine. The other is an electron transporting aluminum hydroxyquinoline. And all of that is capped with a metal cathode. And the basic idea here is you're injecting electrons from the top, holes from the bottom, and those electrons and holes are recombining to give you light, right? What's exciting and why this was a big deal at the time is when you look at their data now, you're talking about seeing light emission that's not that far from the photon energy, right? Only a few volts now to turn this device on. And this was really the beginning of sort of the modern investigation into OLEDs. This was really the first OLED in the sense that now you could get a practical amount of light out at a reasonable, reasonable voltage. We'll talk a little bit about efficiency in a moment. Just to give you some sense, this particular device emitted one photon for every 100 electrons it injected. So operating at what we would call a quantum efficiency of 1%, modern devices now can get to quantum efficiencies of about 40%. So we've, we've come a long way since here but this was enough to effectively start, start the train in motion. So I want to talk a little bit more about the mechanism of how this device works because this is where a key difference between organic and inorganic LEDs is revealed. So this is just a block diagram of that same structure, two electrodes, a hole transporting material, an electron transporting material, so same idea. And what I want to point out is that when we inject electrons and holes into this device, we don't have a simple electron relaxing into the hole between two bands emitting a photon like we would in, say, gallium arsenide. Right? The electron and hole, when they find their way onto the same molecule, the dielectric constant of the material is low enough that that positively charged hole and that negatively charged electron actually are attracted to each other. They actually form a bound state, a coulombically bound state called an exciton. And the fact that they form an exciton is really important to how OLEDs have evolved and materials have evolved over the, uh, over the last couple of uh, decades. So we think of this device now as operating as holes coming in from one direction, electrons from the other. They form this bound electron hole paired called an exciton. That exciton recombines and you get light emission. Now part of the reason why this device only operates at 
is because you're asking this particular material, this electron transporter, to be good at transporting electrons and to simultaneously be good at emitting light. And that's something that isn't usually the case. And so what we'll find is that as we've gone further in evolving the design of these devices, functionality has been separated among more materials in more layers in the device to the point where now in a modern device we have many active layers in the structure. So in order to understand the context of what had to happen and the innovations that had to occur in order to get OLEDs to the point where they're at today, I want to just describe what was limiting the efficiency, that 1%. Why was it 1% and not, not 20% or 50%? So let's briefly talk about this one equation here that I'm going to show. This quantity at left is the external quantum efficiency. So this is how many photons I get out of the device for every electron I put in. That efficiency can be broken up into four separate sub-efficiencies, and I'll describe each of them. The first is the last step, what we call the outcoupling efficiency. That's effectively saying how many of those photons that I emit inside the stack actually get out to the forward viewing direction. Right? There's reflection losses, there's absorption losses, there, there's waveguiding in the substrate. So that outcoupling efficiency tells me how good a job I'm doing pulling photons out of the device. In okay? the simple devices I've shown here, it's maybe 20 to 25 percent. Modern devices, you can certainly do a lot better. This PL efficiency here is the photoluminescence efficiency. It basically just tells me how emissive my material is at sort of an intrinsic level, okay? Modern materials, 100%, we can maximize the photoluminescence efficiency. The exciton formation efficiency effectively tells me how much, uh, how efficiently I'm using injected charges. So when I'm injecting an electron in a hole, are all of them forming excitons or are some leaking by, okay? So again, a modern device, 100%. The last parameter I want to talk about is this spin fraction. This is actually what the big bottleneck was for the commercialization of OLEDs. It turns out that in most organic semiconductor materials, only 25% of the excitons that you create are quantum mechanically allowed to recombine and emit light. So what that's basically saying that in most OLED materials, three quarters of the carriers you inject are basically going to be dark right off the bat. Okay, so imagine losing three quarters of your efficiency for any process before you do anything else. That could seem like a significant bottleneck. And so this spin fraction, which we'll talk more about in a moment, was really the big loss. Right? At the time, OLEDs were being commercialized. Sure, it was an interesting technology, but losing three quarters of your charges to just non-radiative decay, to heat, was viewed as a bottleneck that wasn't going to be uh, possibly, or wasn't going to be able to commercialize the technology if it was still present. So why does this matter? Well, when we think about spin a little bit more in these devices, this spin fraction or this exciton fraction, when you make an exciton, I'm making it from an electron in a hole, okay? And if you think back to sort of chemistry, your electron can have a spin up or spin down, and it turns out your hole can have a spin up or spin down as well. So when I bring those two particles together to form the exciton, there's a variety of different ways those two spins can interact to give me the composite spin of the exciton, okay? And it turns out there's four ways, and they're listed right here, okay? These three particular configurations give me a total spin equal to one, and because there's three of them, we have the creative terminology of calling them triplet states. On this side, I have one state has a spin equal zero, and we call that a singlet state. So why is this important? Well, here's why it's important. The ground state of the molecule is a singlet, okay? The photon has no spin. So if I want to try and get a relaxation event from, say, a singlet, to the ground state, I can do that with a photon, right? Because I've got singlet spin in the excited state, singlet spin in the ground state. We call that fluorescence, and that happens very rapidly, okay? If I look at those triplet states, though, I have a spin equals one triplet trying to go to a spin equals zero singlet. That's not allowed with just a photon, okay? Because the photon can't conserve spin in that process. Usually, this is not an allowed transition, and when it does occur, it's called phosphorescence, and usually it's very inefficient and very slow. So this sort of frames, again, the idea that these states are the ones that are accessible in a common material. This is your loss state, okay? And so the problem at the time was to say, how do we do something with the triplets, right? How do we get those triplets to emit light so we can get 100% harvesting of our excitons? So we're not automatically stuck with only a quarter of the excitons being radiative. Well, really, the, the innovation came in trying to actually realize a method through molecular design and engineering to mix the singlet and triplet state. What you want to try and do is give the triplet a little bit of singlet character so that now that usually forbidden tra transition between the triplet and the singlet becomes allowed, right? So that you can start to see light coming out of that state. 
And the way that that's typically done is to use what's known as the heavy atom effect, right? The heavy atom effect is essentially what happens to the molecule when I attach a heavy atom to the molecular structure, that heavy atom induces mixing between the singlet and triplet, and you can start to get crosstalk between these sorts of states. So I show here sort of the fruit fly green emitter that is uh, developed over the last 20 years in OLEDs. This is a molecule affectionately known as ERPI, irid iridium trisphenylpyridine is its name. And you can see this molecule has this iridium atom bound to the core of the structure, okay? That iridium is actually mixing the tri singlet and triplet states. It's giving some mixing between the states on the metal and the states on the ligand. And what you effectively end up with now is the ability to have singlets convert to triplets, triplets convert to the ground state, and to potentially have all of your excitons being turned into light. This was first observed in a device in 1999, uh, at least at an efficient level out of the force group. And this particular result is interesting in the sense that I'll only pay attention to this top curve. This is a figure out of their paper where you have a quantum efficiency now approaching 10%. This was important because at the time, the limit if you're only using singlets was regarded to be 5%, okay? So if you were getting efficiencies of four, five, 6%, it was thought you're only using the singlets, right? Everything else is still lost. This was the first time a paper had been published where efficiencies were getting to 10% and then beyond. After this, there were efficiencies 15, 20%, and there were indications now that truly you were harvesting all of these excitons. And what's really exciting is that with these phosphorescent type molecules, you can get to the point where your device is 100% internally efficient or very near to it. So what that means is that every carrier you inject now is internally converted to a photon. And you're only limited by your ability to outcouple those emitted photons, right? So to go from a point where only 1% of your injected carriers are committed to photons to the point where now effectively every single one is converted to a photon was a significant advance and really the required advance that had to occur in order to make this technology one that could be suitable for real applications. And so you'll see that many now of the modern OLED materials, certainly if you're opening up your phone and looking at what the green and red emitters are, they will be iridium-coordinated phosphorescent materials. Blue is a different story, and we can talk about that briefly at the end. One thing I want to highlight, just from the perspective of serendipity a little bit here, is that this ERPI molecule, you know, virtually everybody who works on OLEDs has used this molecule at some point. It is truly the fruit fly of this industry. Um, but it wasn't original to that 1999 paper. And so in some respects, this is a lesson to always read old literature. This is a paper from King et al., 1985. So this predates the Kodak first OLED showing room temperature phosphorescence. This is the broadened peak with the broken line. Room temperature phosphorescence from this exact molecule, ERPI, very efficient, clearly showing phosphorescence, clearly ready to be integrated into a device even at this point in time. But it takes that, again, as we all know, combination of seeing that in the literature and being able to contextualize and apply it in the correct way to actually get to that, that interesting outcome. But this molecule was not invented in 1999, well known in uh, just the study of octahedrally coordinated iridium complexes. So where are we so far? So there's two cons configurations we've discussed. The Kodak device, that first device from 1987, is what we would call a fluorescent OLED. It only emits out of that singlet state all of those triplet states are lost, okay? And so as a result, it's only got 25% harvesting of the ex exciton density that's created and only about a 5% efficiency, meaning 5% photons for every, or five photons for every 100 injected. This phosphorescent type paradigm now that we just talked about is one in which now we have induced singlet triplet mixing so that all singlets rapidly relax to the triplet and triplets then become the new dominant low energy radiative transition. And so you're now seeing emission out of that triplet state as opposed to the singlet state. This approach allows you to have 100% exciton harvesting and about a 20% external quantum efficiency that's really limited only by optics. Now, I want to share with you another configuration, and maybe you're guessing that there must be something else coming, giving the blank space here. Uh, in the last few years, there's actually been a new approach that's been devised to basically do the same sort of thing, to realize 100% exciton harvesting. And that approach is known as thermally activated delayed fluorescence. So this is actually kind of an interesting um, angle in the sense that it does not involve mixing the singlet triplet states. It does not involve the use of these precious metals like iridium. What it does instead is it tries to reduce the splitting between the singlet and triplet to basically KT. Okay, so you want to reduce that singlet triplet offset to KT so that now you have the ability for triplets to thermally activate back into the singlet state. All right. And so now the idea would be you would still create singlets and triplets under electrical excitation, 
The singlets would emit immediately in prompt fluorescence. The triplets would sit here for a while, but they're non-radiative, so they have a long lifetime. They would eventually move back to the singlet and give you delayed fluorescence. And there's been a variety of reports over the last four or five years showing that you can get just as high an efficiency device using thermally activated delayed fluorescence. And potentially there could be some advantages here by not having to use these iridium coordinated complexes. I'll mention briefly how this is done because you might be thinking, well, how do you minimize that singlet triplet offset? Really what you need to do is minimize the spatial overlap between the electron and hole densities on the molecule. So the molecules that do this well, and 4CZ IPN is one of them, if you compare where the electrons and holes sit by looking at the occupied orbitals for the electrons and the unoccupied orbitals for the holes, you see that they're effectively, not perfectly, but effectively attempting to get some orthogonality between where those two densities lie. And if you can eliminate that overlap, you can reduce that energetic splitting between the singlet and triplet. And so this is really a place right now where materials engineering, quantum chemistry, and even some aspects of machine learning and AI are being exploited to try and devise new molecules that have this behavior, right? to try and get to high efficiency systems that have a small singlet triplet offset. OK, so with the last phase of my talk, I want to switch gears. I've told you so far about really a materials engineering and in many respects a synthetic chemistry type angle to realizing how to improve exciton harvesting in OLEDs. And I want to tell you a little bit more about interfaces and touch on some of the work that we've been doing here at, at Minnesota. So the initial device I showed you, the Kodak device, only had two active layers. And life is not really that simple. When we think of a more modern organic LED device, you're going to have more layers to the structure. And I mentioned that we're going to have some decoupling of functionality among multiple layers. And so this is still a fairly simple OLED, but reflects more the spirit of what you find today. So you have your two electrodes, and now in between them, you'll have two what are called injection layers. And really, those injection layers are trying to reduce the barriers to push a carrier from the metal into the organic layers. Okay? In many respects, they're also serving to planarize rough substrates to get improved yield. You're going to have hole and injection transport material. Now, those are your primary pathways through which you're feeding the emitter with charges. And now you have a separate emissive layer. Okay? This emissive layer now typically consists of multiple materials, which I'll touch more on in a moment. So right away, you can see that this device effectively consists of many interfaces, and there's a lot of issues you have to deal with in trying to optimize those. And so we already touched on the fact that we need to engineer barriers for charge injection. We need to engineer barriers for charge transport and injection between organic layers. And also, you want to manipulate this emissive layer design to try and keep all of your charges in that layer and maximize the number of them that form excitons. Right? We don't want charge to leak out of the device. We want it to stay in the emissive layer, form an exciton, and emit light. Okay, so I'll talk to you more about that angle. So in thinking about this emissive layer design, that Kodak device had a very simple emissive layer. It was just one layer, right? We said that the electron transport layer in that Kodak device was simultaneously serving as the light emitting layer. And we said that was part of the issue. And if you've ever done any kind of photophysical measurements on dyes, you know that if you want to get the maximum luminescence efficiency out of a dye, you want to use the, the dye in a dilute solution, not a concentrated solution. When we have concentrated solutions, intermolecular interactions serve to quench the excited state. You get more non-radiative recom recombination, and you reduce the light out of your sample. Okay? The same thing happens in the solid state. And so there's very few materials that will actually emit light efficiently in neat film. Most of them will emit light much more efficiently in a solid solution, where maybe now your emissive green species here is at perhaps 2, 3 weight percent in a host where that host has a very large energy gap and hence can't accept energy from the guest. Okay? And so this is actually very much what OLEDs tend to do today. Take that emissive guest, maybe it's a phosphorescent material, dilute it into a wide energy gap host, and now the host is really there just to funnel charge to the guest. The guest is there to take that charge and essentially recombine to emit light. Okay? Now, there's a couple of iterations beyond this structure that have come up, and really this structure has problems in the sense that your host has to be ambipolar, right? You're funneling electrons and holes through that layer, and so it has to be good at doing both, and there's not necessarily an abundance of ambipolar materials that work in this capacity. So two other schemes that have been used is this one, which is a double emissive layer architecture, which is really one where you have an electron and hole transporting emissive layer, one that carries electrons, one that carries holes. And you're basically funneling charges to the emissive layer and getting all of your excitons to form at the emissive layer in effectively a narrow strip at that interface. Right? Another approach that we've spent a fair bit of time working on is one in which you go in the opposite direction and uniformly mix all of the components of your system. 
So now you effectively rely on the fact that you've got continuous pathways for both holes and electrons, so that holes and electrons can permeate this entire layer and be pulled off by the guest throughout the structure. What's nice about this particular device is that you actually spread out how, where the excitons actually rely in the device, lower that density on average, and can reduce things like bimolecular processes that can lead to quenching or lead to degradation of your film. What's troubling about this particular approach is because you have these connected pathways, charge can leak right across the device, right? So in many respects, your utilization might not be as high if you have just a single mixture without some blocking layers on either side. So some work we did um, a number of years ago is actually to try and balance both of these approaches together and see if we could actually make an efficient OLED out of just a single deposited layer. And so avoid having to use all of these additional layers in the device and see if we can just use one layer as a way to get to an efficient device. And our approach was to try and combine the best of the two approaches that were on the previous slide, which is to say use a composition gradient, where now we have this internal region of the device that's very mixed, allows us to lower these exciton densities and perhaps realize some benefit in degradation and efficiency, but transition to regions of the device that are effectively pure, so that at the end of the day we can still get some confinement so that a hole traveling through the device will eventually slow down because it's seeing more of the electron transporter, and an electron traveling through the device will eventually slow down because it sees more of the hole. We can engineer these sorts of composition gradients just by engineering the deposition rates that we use in the vacuum chamber as we do a co-deposition. And I'll note that as, as part of an I-prime project, we actually collaborated with physical electronics to show that the depth profiling that we get from XPS actually matches uh, what we plan to grow based on our, our deposition profiles. I note that we've been able to get efficient RGB um, emission out of these sorts of structures. And what's really interesting and something that we've only recently uh, better understood is some of the knock-on benefits to these mixed and graded structures when it comes to efficiency and lifetime. So this is some older data where we actually show a normalized efficiency as a function of current density. And what I'm trying to show you here is not a peak efficiency at low current density. All of these OLEDs have very high efficiency at low current density. What I'm trying to point out is that as you run the device harder, say you're going to higher brightness, these graded and mixed structures maintain their efficiency uh, to higher current density. And the reason why is because you're spreading all those charges and excitons out over the entire device lowering the density and turning off many of the exciton-exciton bimolecular loss pathways that remove your efficiency at high current density, right? So by having a lower density, those bimolecular processes are not as severe. Very recently in work we've been doing with the Dow Chemical Company, we've also been able to say something quantitatively about the role of these mixed and graded structures on device stability, device lifetime, which is really an important point as we look forward in OLEDs. And what we find is that when we think about degradation in an OLED, Sure, the efficiency is falling with time, but just saying that the efficiency is falling with time doesn't give you a vector for how to improve the device. So with Dow, we've developed methods to actually decouple that overall efficiency and understand is it the photoluminescence efficiency or that exciton formation efficiency that are degrading with time. And what we find here is that as we increase the thickness of the mixture, it's that photoluminescence efficiency that's changing, the open symbols, uh, with structure, right? So it's actually the photoluminescence efficiency that's becoming more stable as you go to these mixed devices and graded devices. And again, we've been able to go back and model this by looking at these bimolecular processes as a means to introduce uh, quenching defects in the system. So with that, I want to finish up by just uh, talking about some of the ongoing areas of research that certainly we have interest in and the industry as a whole is looking at for uh, essentially a way to continue to commercialize the breadth of uh, OLED technology, um, perhaps one of the largest areas of improvement that's needed is to maximize efficiency further through optical engineering. And so again, this comes back to the idea that just because we emit a photon internal to the, 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 internal to the device doesn't mean we necessarily get it out of the device, right? It could be absorbed or reflected or waveguided. And so developing low-cost ways to first deal with that optical problem on the outside, right? whether it's dealing with lens arrays, whether it's dealing with patterning, but also trying to deal with the internal aspect of the device, right? How to actually frustrate the population of those modes right from the get-go. And a really interesting series of work that's going on right now is to actually, instead of just relying on some sort of external optical management, actually try to align the emitter molecules during deposition so that the emissive dipole is oriented in such a way that it doesn't excite those, those waveguiding modes anymore. And that's been a path that's shown actually really significant improvements in efficiency so far, trying to align your emitter dipole to, uh, to essentially get only those, uh, those modes outcoupled to the device. 
Um, flexible displays, you know, we're getting close in terms of realizing truly flexible products. As we think about how to enable flexible displays, you know, really the key aspects that we need additional expertise on are how to get good flexible encapsulants that have long lifetime and repeated mechanical robustness, but also we need to better understand how to get complementary flexible circuitry and batteries. If we're really talking about displays that we can fold and unfold and squish and uncrunch and, and, and do all these sorts of things to, we have to remember that there's a lot of balance of systems beyond just the emissive display element that then also has to come along and be flexible as well. And so innovation in those respects is also really important. Um, blue electroluminescence continues to be an area of active research just from the perspective that in current OLED displays, the blue emitter is not a phosphor. And so the red and green are, but the blue is not. And the reason why is because phosphorescent blues are typically not stable and actually have poor spectral purity, which is hard for me to admit because most of my PhD thesis was on blue phosphorescence. <laughs> but, but this is a place where certainly other approaches like these thermally activated delayed fluorescence emitters, these TADF systems, could be very interesting for, for blue emission. And so that's an area of active research that's, that's certainly very interesting. And then finally, an area that would just help overall in how we discover and design materials would just have, be have better structure property relationships for what materials combinations lead to a poor deg degradation device, right? So right now, much of the work is done in a very brute force fashion of combining different materials, measuring the lifetime, and then hoping to find some sorts of trends. It would be better to have a deeper understanding of selection rules for how I choose a host, how I pair it with a particular guest, and what are the interactions I need to worry about to better understand whether or not that combination is going to degrade. And that's certainly an area that we work on with, uh, with Dow and ongoing work. Uh, so last thing I'll just say is if you're interested in more information about our program or the work we do, I would encourage you to come to our afternoon program review. We have a lot of great talks uh, spanning all aspects of our program. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. For those of you who have questions, I encourage you to seek Russ out later at this meeting, and I'm sure he'd be happy to, to talk with you. We have a few acknowledgments to make. We'd like to thank the College of Science and Engineering for their support, and especially uh, the support of Dean Moscave, uh, the Office of the Vice President of Research, and, and, and Deal, Dean uh, Ellen Levine, College of Biological Sciences, and, and Dean Valerie Forbes for their support of iPrime, and then also the MERSEC directed by, by Tim Lodge. Uh, this meeting really wouldn't be possible without the efforts of, of Joe Belvedere. Is Joe in here? Okay, well, you've all seen her at some point, but, but without her. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> As you all know, she works incredibly hard to make the, the meeting possible, and she's had a number of volunteers, notably uh, C.J. Stone, uh, who we, we're also very grateful for his help and a number of students. As far as where to go next, there's a sign outside that indicates where the different sessions are for the program reviews. And another touch we have this year is, a, is part of a, uh, honoring Chris. You'll find some white sheets outside taped to the wall. If you'd like to write some greetings to Chris, please feel free to do so. Enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat>